possible. Yeah, you can just do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 If I look back how I became an artist, I believe it came from my very early upbringing. I was brought up very religious and about the doctrines of the church and whatnot. And there's a lot of mythology because there is really no proof. And so they would talk about things that was not really proof of. And I think that is the spiritual and soul aspect. You know, it's about your feeling and your emotion. So that was very important to me. And to have these objects of ceremony and objects of worship. So as I began to grow up, I wanted to experience everything. So I never had a specific goal of what I wanted to be. So I studied architecture. That was a real dream, you know, doing architecture and landscaping and space. But then when we came to Canada, we immigrated when I was about 17. Uh, we had no money and we all had to work. So I tried 10 different jobs in one year. And at the very end, I had two eight hour jobs in order to make enough money to pay for the tuition fee to go to college, which eventually happened. And then I went in, to the University of Michigan and I studied architecture. But because I had no money, I figured I should make objects. They had street fairs and I looked at it and said, you know, I can do better than that. And I began to make objects like candelabra, snufters, trivets, and I did very well. Then I upgraded it to wall hangings and, and that went very well. And then I went into um, sculpture. So I was supporting myself, my architectural studies with making sculpture. I started off, you know, with a very uh, small studio on the Lower East Side. It was $75, no heat, and I had an extension cord from the studio next door. And I had a potbelly stove. And I started to make uh, objects again in order to make ends meet. Tiffany's, uh, I met the people who did Tiffany's windows, and they said, Hans, how would you like to do the window? And I had done the windows for Bloomingdale's and Orbex and so Tiffany, then I really thought about it, and I thought, they sell permanents. When they wanted to display diamonds and jewels in my work, I thought, why don't they make my work that disintegrates? To show them the separation between disintegration and, and between real value. So I made fountains. And I, I never made a fountain, but I found these metal, steel metal shelves that were used in commercial storage closets and I found them on the street and objects, and I bent them and whatnot, and I began to make fountains out of that stuff. But the water 
was disintegrating the metal, so the, the water became rusty water, brown, and after a while it was like soup. But the object looked so beautiful, so people would go there frequently to see how far these fountains would they rust. Well, I was only in there for two or three weeks. Then I got phone calls from people. They said, well, can you make these fountains so they last? And I asked around, they said, how do you make a fountain last? They said, well, you have to make it out of copper or stainless steel or brass. So I ventured into making fountains out of copper. And it kept growing and growing. And after about uh, a few years, I had 18 assistants. And it was fun to really work with these young, I was a little older, and these were young, talented people who became huge after they left me. And so when I had made enough money making fountains, I was all over the world and sold them to important people. Then I said, okay, now I've made enough money. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to make sculpture. Things that have no purpose except aesthetic purposes. When I do large sculptures outside, they're usually stainless steel. Stainless steel is very strong and very rigid and very structural. Stainless steel is also reflective, so it is in a distance more noticeable because it's reflective. When you work in bronze, it is beautiful sensuous material and it is centuries old, but because of its inherent dark color, even the patinas are often dark, it becomes reductive. So a sculpture that you see is, feels smaller than it is, except when you come closer and you measure your own body to the sculpture. Now what I do, so I've decided to make a sculpture in bronze or in stainless, then we get the material and I draw with a big magic marker the shapes that I want. Then these uh, shapes get cut out. So now you have a shape you like. Now that shape, we have to begin to turn and twist to make it three-dimensional. Once we have that and we want to make a voluminous sculpture, that means it's a hollow piece that has six sides, then we begin to, with cardboard, build the sides up. And that's a lot by trial and error. And once we have done that, then we build, we make paper templates that we lie on the metal and we cut that out. And now we have the next shape and we bend it and twist it until it fits to the first shape. And we may put structural material inside, such as uh, diaphragms or plates or beams, I-beams, or rods to hold the things into place. And then we weld certain shapes beforehand and we add them to the sculpture. We may cut into the sculpture to get more contact and to get it more like it flows from one form into the next. And that is all very time consuming. And sometimes I just stack shapes. And welds are very strong, and the welds are usually made not in the middle of a shape, but on the edges, because the edges are very rigid and strong. So we try to weld edge to edge. As I make compounded curves and you weld them together, the shape becomes incredibly strong. Because if one curve goes one way and the other curve goes the other way, you weld them together, it becomes a rigid shape. And the reason why that is important is when a sculpture is being transported and it lies on its side, that it can take the vibration. Or if it's picked up by a crane or a forklift, that there is enough structural strength that if they put cables around it, that they can lift it without doing damage to the sculpture. So my sculptures typically are very, very strong.
sculptor makes a drawing is very different from a painter or a draftsman. A sculptor, as he draws, is always thinking in the back of his head, how do I make this? If I make a drawing, can I actually pull it off the paper, make it three-dimensional and have it work? So often a sculptor's drawings are a little bit glorified construction drawings. And they are deal very much with form and structure and relationships of these forms uh, with one another, the balance, how it is attached. So when you make a drawing, you think, how do I make it? How does this touch that? And how will it look on the back side? Because a painting is two-dimensional, you only view it from one side, and a drawing is two-dimensional, you view it from one side. However, when a sculptor makes a drawing, it is almost a three-dimensional, two-dimensional work. I've, I've always made drawings, and I make them after I've made a sculpture, before and during, because I'm trying to figure out how to make the connections. Nowadays, I've been drawing a lot, and I use watercolor, and I begin to make the drawings almost like a dream-like. So when you look at a drawing, it is not finalized, it is not rigid and fixed. It has still possibilities of changing. So it is in a sense a, a moving work. What do you choose for a final finished look? Should it be red? Should it be brown? Should it be green? Sometimes forms predict what color it should be. When a shape is very soft and flowing, you don't want to put a hard color on it because it disappears. The color overwhelms the form. So there's always this fine line between color and form. I know that red is very attractive to people, it's very noticeable, or white. And you know, sometimes you paint a sculpture red, it is just more festive. Sometimes you think black is so peaceful, or white is so pure. With bronzes, if the color isn't right, we can, you can go over a bronze patina sculpture and, and emphasize certain parts. So I may look at a shape and say, well, it would be nicer if the bottom was a little darker and the top a little lighter to show the evolution of the shape. Now, if you paint a sculpture black, it disappears at night. You paint a sculpture white, even with a tiny bit of light, you can see it. Bronze disappears at night. Stainless steel, it'll pick up the minute little bit of light on the scratched surface, because they're all minute mounds and valleys, which are basically tiny little prisms that reflect the light. So, with the tiniest little bit of light, stainless steel will be visible. So color is always uh, complex because I have done many colored pieces and sometimes painted ten times the same sculpture before I was satisfied. Uh, whether it would be one color or a combina combination of color, because you know how it is in a painting. When you uh, choose green and then you put a yellow next to it, all of a sudden the green doesn't work anymore. So you got to redo the green. Now, when you have redone the green, the yellow becomes different or it dictates to have some more of another color. So it is basically creativity as process. The state of Nebraska, in order to celebrate the American Bicentennial uh, in 1976, they put out a request from artists around the world to create a sculpture for the state of Nebraska. And what they did, the, the Interstate 80, that goes from east to west, is 452 miles long. And they felt that every hour there should be a sculpture with a bathroom facilities and whatnot. So the people drove across the state of Nebraska. Every hour they could stop and they could have a work of art. And well, that was a wonderful idea. So it was the longest museum in the world they created with eight pieces. 
About 160 to 180 artists worldwide entered their ideas. And I was very blessed. I was one of the eight artists selected. What my concept was is that although the Nebraska is a very low uh, uh, horizon state, the sky is about 90% of the landscape. The land itself is 10%. So what I thought, since the roads were straight and you would drive up a hill, down a hill, and you would see the road miles ahead. And what I did, I took a cloverleaf roadway confluence. I set it up vertically. So now we have a cloverleaf standing vertically and I could make the two roads that what you were on very tall. They were, these were 40 feet tall. And as they came closer, they began to discover the cloverleaf and then the whole thing began to make sense. What was very interesting in this particular sculpture, it had to be approved by the villages in the neighborhood where my sculpture was placed. So I had to go and give lectures at a nunnery, at a high school, at an elementary school. I had to give uh, uh, some evenings at the town hall uh, to explain it. And the whole community got involved. They all loved it because we all did this together. And it put basically that city uh, called Sydney, Nebraska, on the map. And by having the town involved, what was uh, quite wonderful is that this sculpture was three sections that were very carefully interwoven when they, we uh, put them together and erected. They were able to fit on an enormous truck, but it was an oversized load. As they come to each border of each state, the sculpture was fabricated in uh, New Jersey. They had to get a special permit and they could only drive after uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, what happened, there was so much delay in paperwork, etc., that the sculpture was not going to be in time to be installed. So the governor of the state of Nebraska, talking about power, he called up each governor of each different state. He said, look, we've got to drive the sculpture day and night to get it here in time. And so each state provided them police escorts. And for me, this was so much fun because I'm just a sculptor. But to hear all the other stuff that goes with it in order to realize a project of this 40-foot magnitude, which was enormous for me. Since the sculpture had to be raced from New Jersey to Nebraska, the truck driver drove his full throttle and there was a lot of black smoke which came onto the sculpture. And so when the sculpture arrived, it was pretty dirty. And the whole town came with cleaning material and grinders and and there must have been 30, 40 people working on these sculptures in a matter of two days. Anyhow, it all came together. 10 minutes before the installation, the announcement, everyone was waiting, and here came the helicopter with the governor in it. And uh, it was all such, so much fun, you know, the whole drama. And Andy Warhol always says, well, you know, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. And this was one of the few 15 minutes I had in my life. I have this client who had just built this uh, very large marina, which is on the Hudson River by uh, Haverstraw, actually where the Tappan Zee Bridge is. When they did the Tappan Zee Bridge, they needed a lot of soil. And this man had this large piece of land, and they took the soil from this land, and he created, in a sense, this enormous body of water, which he then converted into a marina. So for the marina, he wanted a sculpture that was large enough and that was noticeable for, as a navigational marker for the people when they were on the Hudson River. How do you find the exact entrance to a marina? You either have a, a, a light tower or whatnot. So he thought, it, it, uh, we came up with several design requirements. And one of them was that the sculpture should be white. White shows up very well, so th that's one thing. The second thing is, to create something on the water, I, I thought of the idea of a, what, what is used in marine, in the marine world. In the marine world, you have a lot of waves, and waves is made from circles. So when you drop a rock in the water, you get concentric circles. If you do a cross-section of the concentric circles, you actually get a wave. 
I thought it was nice to just use those two elements into a sculpture, to combine them. And that's why the word circles and waves came about. Uh, so it's really re related to marine and navigational concepts. Then the next thing was, what is the scale? So it can be seen from several miles away. And how do we know if we're lined up to the mouth of the harbor? And basically, if the two circles, if you could look through the center opening, that means you were straight on course with the entrance to the harbor. So once all these ideas were, came together and the sculpture was executed, the, the sculpture had to be 35 foot uh, tall and 35 foot wide. And it could not be transported on the road as a piece. So we broke it down in sections and basically all these pieces were welded together on the site. And the site was a hill, we created a hill so that the whole sculpture could be seen clearly, like as if it was sitting on a horizon line. This was quite an enormous scale. It had to also be structurally sound, so that in case of a 100 mile an hour wind with two inches of ice attached to it, the sculpture would still stand on its own structural integrity. It actually became very successful because it you know, there is no such thing as a sculpture used as a navigational marker. This is just private use. But it all fell into place and the owner was so happy. What he did after the sculpture was installed, everybody loved it because it was easy to say, oh, my boat is at the marina where the huge sculpture sits. So what he did, he increased the footage for dock space by a dollar a foot. So he had paid for the sculpture within about six months and it has been there already 20 years. I would say my inspiration mostly comes from nature. The whole interaction and the magic, the miracle of nature, and how the light changes, and you know, let's say in film, and in sculpture, light is very important. Without light, there would be no film or no sculpture. So I think a sculpture for me, or a work of art, is multidimensional. It is not just an image. It is, what does the image tell you? How is it executed? What is the longevity of this image and the mechanical aspect of the work. But now how do you take all these ingredients and make your unique object so that when people walk in places, say, oh, that is a Henry Moore, or that's a David Smith, or that's a Picasso, you want to get to that level that people begin to recognize your work. By looking at many, many different artists, you really begin to learn a little bit of each one and you incorporate this as your language. So, I, from example, David Smith, I learned how to weld, how to make the shapes. Um, from Picasso, you learn ideas. He was an idea man. From Matisse, you learn about composition. And let's say Henry Moore about craftsmanship and scale. These people made large sculpture. And then, of course, it's very significant where works are placed. The sighting of a work is very important. If it's in the wrong spot, nobody will see it. If it's in the right spot, it will be, could be fantastic. What is fascinating, I've probably had over a hundred assistants in my lifetime. And there are maybe half a dozen assistants who are exceptional. The best one, who is Kevin Miller, and you'll see him working with me. He, his education was, he worked for a foundry. He was a natural craftsman. He starts and he works. He doesn't wander around and saying, what should I be doing? How do we do this? He is very focused. Kevin and I have worked together for more than 17 years. And there is respect between us. There's also love between us. I love him, and I know he loves me. And to have that feeling 
which is maybe strange to talk about as an artist, but love is a very big part in life and in, in creativity. When there is love, there is a form of trust, and it is a cooperative attitude. What is so nice with Kevin is that he understands, he, he is like my right hand, literally, physically my right hand. If I tell him, why don't we do this or do that? He says, yeah, I got it. He understands. Because when I draw, my, my, I have certain lines that have certain thicknesses and certain proportions and a certain angle of flow. He knows how to do that. He really loves to see my ideas realized. And his name, his, his initials are always behind my signature. So that he feels that this was a part by him. And at this point, as I've gotten older, Kevin is really the main source for the production. And we discuss it. And I ask him, how shall we do this? Shall we do it that way? And I am more the, the inspiration and the connection to the outside world. And it, it's, it's a very unique marriage. You know, we, we've known each other longer than I've been in any relationship. And it is incredibly respectful because when we greet each other, we are happy to see each other. And when we leave, we are thankful for the time that we work together. And, and we look forward to, after the weekend, to work again together. And it is very, very special. The sculptures I've been working on for the last six or seven years are called men here, M-E-N-H-I-R. And in the dictionary it says these are standing stones, not stones that lie down, but stones that are vertical. And what I've done in, in, the, in the metal, because stones have to be stacked very gently and maybe with little support so they don't fall, in welding, and my shapes, by the way, are hollow. They are six-sided, and they're hollow. They would be too heavy otherwise. And what I can do, I can stack them, and as soon as I can cantilever one out, very far out, and ordinarily it would fall, but because of the technique of welding, I can do it. So I can make rather provocative sculptures in this Men Here series. Now I'm even stacking more finer, delicate shapes. I'm doing very tall columns, which are stacked, but they're welded with an inner structure. So these came about by traveling to Ireland, where I saw fields of stones. And then I looked through old history books, and people have been stacking these stones, and they had certain meanings. So that's what I have been doing, influenced directly by this natural phenomena.